Hey indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond, and today I am streaming outside the visible light spectrum in near infrared using my IR modified Lumix GH4 camera. It's shooting at 720 nanometers, a spectrum not that far off from what the near cam on the James Webb Space Telescope is capturing. We'll talk about the kind of photos that this camera can take and what kind of interesting artifacts come with infrared photography. Wait, it's me, I'm live now. <laughs> <laughs> Who's ready to play around in infrared? <laughs> I thought this would be fun today. Uh, I have my my camera set up here. This infrared camera, I've never used it for streaming. I rarely use it to shoot video. We'll talk about the photos today that I, I have shot with it over the years uh, and why I enjoy using a IR converted camera. Uh, but really, I mean, I just wanted to see this. <laughs> this look. Uh, so thank you for joining me on, on where are we, YouTube, Twitch. Uh, we're on a few other platforms as well. Uh, you may want to come over to YouTube or Twitch if you are on one of the other platforms. But uh, say hi when you can in the chat, and, uh, and I'll answer your questions along the way. So I guess, first of all, we should talk about, like, what is even happening with this camera. Uh, this is a regular Lumix GH4 camera. It's one of my older cameras I had. And so a few years ago, I decided I had, I have enough cameras. I, I've been lucky that Panasonic has given me several cameras over the years. Uh, so I decided rather than selling this one off or something, I should just convert it to an infrared camera. And so I sent it off to a company called Kalari Vision. Uh, I can actually pull them up right here. Um, this company, I think they're in Texas, maybe. Let's see if it says at the bottom. And I think it was like $300 for me to convert my camera. Let's see if they have the Lumix here. Um, I mean, they have some Sony's. Yeah, it costs two ninety nine dollars for any of these cameras. And essentially, the way it works is cameras, camera sensors can already pick up infrared and visible light. Uh, and I believe they might have a filter already on the sensor that blocks the infrared. Um, or if not, what happens is when Kalari Vision gets their hands on it, they just add a new filter called a hot mirror, and it blocks all the visible light. And so this camera is only capturing... It's the, ca the camera up here that's seeing me is capturing visible light, uh, but this camera in front of it is is only capturing the 720 nanometer spectrum of infrared light. Let's see who we have in the chat so far. Uh, Kevin Hawthorne is here on YouTube. Good to see you. Eric Picardza does on Twitch and says, so much blue. <laughs> and he says, ain't it ironic that infrared is blue? Well, yeah, let's talk about what this spectrum means, 720 nanometers, and, uh, and, and how the color is coming into the camera. Because really, the color is kind of subjective. I mean, as filmmakers, hopefully by now you've learned that white balance and how you color grade, it's all your choice, your personal choice. And it's the same with like raw photos. It's like when you take a raw photo and you edit it, you know, the colors you choose are not necessarily reflective of reality, but they have some relationship to reality. And the same is true with infrared here, because really I'm capturing something that cannot be expressed in visible light. Um, the, the color spectrum that we see, I believe it's like 300 nanometers to 700. What is it? Uh, any color experts out there here? We'll go, uh, we'll look at it here on, here's a color thing. Yeah. So like violet color down at the bottom is like 400 nanometers wavelength and it goes all the way up to 700, uh, which is red. And then infrared means near red. So it's the area of light that's just outside of what we can see, very close to red, but uh, above or below red, really. It's a, it's a longer wavelength. And so one thing I can show you on this camera is if I go to the white balance here, I had to white balance this camera to give me kind of a pleasant color that is interesting to look at. And so if I change the white balance here, I mean, let's just go to like the presets on the camera. Now we're getting weird, weird colors. Like this is what, this is what the camera wants to do. So you can see the camera is trying to portray me in some sort of red area, but this is like, there's no detail here. There's no, uh, color separation and so you know it's especially weird and so i've come up with several 
custom white balance modes for myself. Let's see. These are primarily the ones I use. Um, this one or this one. Um, I mean, I, the blue is kind of interesting because it like almost presents my skin. I guess it's like way bluer than it should be. I like how the beard looks purple. Um, but yeah, you can choose kind of whatever color balance and we'll show in Lightroom. I mean, let me just pull up Lightroom real quick. Like here is a photo I shot in infrared and I mean, right out of the camera, let's see. Yeah, if I say white balance as shot, oh, the as shot is even weirder. Or no, yeah, that's what it looks like. When I try to auto it, the Lightroom is like, I don't know what to do with this. It wants to make it purple. I mean, we're dealing with white balance values that are outside of what Lightroom wants to deal with. And so you kind of can't even, can't even use their settings. Um, I have to go like below there, there, I can't remember how I, how I did it, but there is a tool like in Camera Raw where you can like kind of re readjust the the color balance to be like beyond the spectrum or kind of like shift it. Um, and so I, sometimes I can start with a photo that's different uh, or that's, that's kind of corrected for the red shift. But a lot of times when you're shooting in infrared, you just end up going into black and white anyway. And we'll talk about how infrared can make some really interesting black and white photos and why you might choose it over over a regular color camera. Let's see what else people are saying right now. Uh, Eric Picard says, says, almost looks like false color on camera monitors. Yeah, there is one photo I have. Let me see if I can find it. It um, Where you actually can do kind of like a switch. Like a lot of, let me go back into Lightroom. A lot of photos in infrared, when you color grade them, you kind of end up with like, like here's one where I haven't made it black and white. I've just color graded it. and the sky looks kind of yellow, um, but you can do kind of like a color inversion where if you know you end up with like yellow skies a lot, you can kind of like flip the yellow and make it into a blue. And it has some other, you know, that, that'll change some other things in the image too, but you can kind of fake a sky and get some really interesting photos that way. So you see a lot of people taking infrared photos and like flipping the sky values. Um, but a lot of times I just leave them or, or go to black and white. Um, here's one of my favorite photos I've ever taken in infrared. Um, so I might as well talk about some of the some of the artifacts that that happen. I mean, one like you could tell I have a, a purple beard right now, but a couple of the the primary things that happen in infrared that make it really interesting to shoot with, and especially to shoot outdoors in and and, sh and shoot like nature shots, landscape shots. Um, we'll talk in a minute about why like the lighting that's happening right here inside is kind of strange for infrared, but the lighting outside is perfect because it's all sunlight and the sun is actually more than half of the sunlight that hits the earth is infrared. It's like 52%. Um, so the sun is a great infrared light source. And I'll show you in a moment how the LED lights I'm using are not actually a great L uh, infrared source. I think most of the lighting we're seeing on me right now is coming from the window and I'll, I'll show you in a minute what, what it looks like when I turn some of these off. But this photo is a good example of like why infrared is really cool to shoot black and white with. And actually, can I turn off the black and white? Oh yeah, so here it is in its red glory. But a couple things that happen in infrared that are really interesting. One is that trees reflect all the light back. Like plants don't need infrared light to do photosynthesis. They need visible light. So they absorb what I imagine would be like the blues and the, wait, am I, or am I saying this wrong? I don't, actually, no, I imagine trees absorb the red light or the purpley lights. And what's left is the green that bounces off. It's kind of the opposite of those colors. Um, that's assuming I, I remember <laughs> biology and, and how light works. But the, the plants are rejecting that light, or, which is why it bounces off and they look green. They, uh, they also don't need the infrared light, so they're rejecting that. So in infrared, plants just look bright white because they're just giving all the light back. They're not taking any of it. Um, so that's an interesting artifact. And then infrared also travels through things better. It's a longer wavelength. Is that right? Yeah, longer wavelengths go through things easy, more easily, like radio waves. Um, lower frequencies go through walls more easily uh, with sound. So... Infrared light travels through clouds 
an atmosphere a little bit easier. It can travel through some, and actually we'll, we'll talk about the skin in a moment. It can travel through a, a little layer of skin. It just moves through things better, uh, which I think is why the James Webb Telescope uses it to, to see deeper into space for one, one of the reasons. So skies typically just look black in infrared, uh, which is cool because you get a lot more cloud contrast. So clouds are bright white, skies are just like deep black, and then you get this, this interesting uh, tree effect. So it's great to go out to just like a landscape where there's cloudy skies happening. It's, it's less interesting when there's no clouds in the sky because then you just get this pool of black sky. Um, here's another one. I mean, anytime there's, there's clouds in the sky, it looks, it looks pretty interesting. Here's another one where I chose not to go all black and white, although probably this one would look pretty cool in black and white. Um, but the thing that tells you that it's infrared, like if you're looking at shots and you want to know if it was an infrared camera, is that tree, that white tree effect. Because, yeah, you just wouldn't get that from a normal black and white photo. And you wouldn't get these deep, deep black skies uh, without shooting an infrared. Here's another one. Yeah, and because the water is reflecting the sky, it's very deep, deep black water. Yeah, Eric said it was like false color on camera monitors. It is It is a lot like that. Um, and so let's go back. I also want to look at like what it's doing with skin. So, and we'll, and we'll look at the lighting here too. Let me, let me zoom into myself here and, and really focus. So the infrared is interesting because it kind of like misses the first layer of your skin. It's like... It's sneaking in and it's like bouncing off like my second layer of skin. Uh, and so you kind of lose like some imperfections on your face. It's it's almost a f more flattering look infrared because you're just kind of missing like the messy, bumpy first layer of skin and you're kind of getting, getting through the skin a little bit, um, which is interesting. Also, eyes kind of get lost. So like unless you're really lighting up an eye, let me see if I can curious like if this little light is throwing anything everything that's not sunlight seems to look really yellow uh, in this white balance that i'm using right now because uh, clearly it's not the same color spectrum as what's color coming in i mean even when i set the lights these led lights to try to match sunlight i think because we're not dealing with visible light we're not dealing with the blue and yellow light we're dealing with something that's beyond that and this light probably doesn't have a lot of like that beyond uh, near infrared color so if anything this might even, I, I don't even know if, if this is infrared we're seeing or if this is visible light that this sensor is still picking up and presenting as yellow. Um, but yeah, you kind of have to light up someone's eyes so they don't like completely disappear into blackness. Um, what I really need to get is like some infrared torches. I mean, it'd be cool to have lighting that's completely invisible to the eye. I've heard of people doing that with like their Oculus Quest that if they, you know, the Oculus uses infrared for tracking. In fact, I think I have a photo of this. I'll show you. Um, and so if you're like, you know, if you're in a dark room, you can have trouble tracking with an Oculus, but you could be exercise, uh, exercising, playing video games in the dark, in the pitch black, and then fill your room with like infrared lighting, infrared torches. And would that would be enough for the... Um, uh, for the oculus to to track with and to like see the room around you so here are the infrared dots happening on the outside of the oculus and the infrared dots happening on the on the controllers and that's how the, the so there's infrared cameras on the on the headset that are looking around at the uh, at the controllers actually this is an old this is nick's old oculus rift and the reason the headset had dots was because there was another camera in the room that looked out onto the headset. I have, I don't have the new Oculus Quest 2, but I have the original Oculus Quest. And it did, I can't remember what they call it, headset tracking. I mean, the headset did the tracking itself. It had all the cameras on the headset. So I don't believe there are any dots on mine, uh, just on the controllers, because the headset itself is looking around the room and looking uh, for the controllers. But that's kind of one fun thing about infrared is seeing all the things that you don't normally get to see. Like here's I'm a little bit out of focus here. Here's a remote 
And if I push a button here, that's what happens when you use a remote. Or actually, let me do, um, I'll do my, my, uh, oh, yeah, I'll do my, my, my face ID. Oh, there it goes. It's, it's looking for my face right now. Blink, 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 blink. <laughs> and let's see if it, we see it on my face. Yeah, it's shining on my face right now. There it goes. So let me turn off, I wanna turn off the visible lights real quick and show you. So like right now I have this aperture bouncing off the wall at me. I have the sun over here. To your eye in visible light, these look like pretty similar color temperatures. Uh, but it seems like in the infrared light uh, that's happening on my face, this is giving me more kind of a yellow cast. Um, so I'm gonna turn off both the backlight behind me. Let's see if this works. There it goes. Uh, and then we'll turn off this one too. And actually, I think you could see that like they weren't doing all that much in infrared. Most of the light that's happening is bouncing off, is the sunlight coming in and bouncing off the wall. In visible light, we can see that those lights were doing quite a bit. Let me turn this back on. Like I really needed that to have proper exposure on my face. But if I go back to the infrared shot and shut this off, yeah, it's just not making a big difference. So I think that was kind of a research question I had was like, how much light, how much infrared light are these things putting out? I don't have an exact answer, but it doesn't seem like a lot. Um, I'm gonna turn on that backlight again and see how much difference that makes in the shot. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, you could see something's happening over here. But I mean, this thing is at full brightness behind me. It's very bright and it's only kind of like throwing a little bit of yellow on my face. Uh, it's doing a lot more work for the visible cameras or visible light cameras. So one thing I wanna show you because of what it does to skin is that, you know, it, it does the weird thing to your eyes it makes your skin look a little softer. And then it also can see through to blood vessels pretty well. And I think I have an example of that. Let's see. Oh, and by the way, here's Nick using Face ID. You know, right here, you can barely see it on my face. But if you go into a pitch black room and use an IR camera, you can really see the dots that the Face ID throws on your face. And it's like a bunch over, over, you know, one second or a half second. It kind of like flashes a bunch of times. Here are some blood veins. Now, granted, I did have to, let's see, well, let me, here's the original. I did have to exaggerate it with contrast and more, um, you know, what are some of these settings? I went all black and white. I upped the contrast all the way. Um, I added clarity, which does a lot to, to pull that out. Um, but they definitely are more visible. Uh, so you could do some really cool, like goth Halloween photography with infrared as well, uh, just because you can see those those blood vessels. I guess just because you're kind of missing that first layer of skin that, that blocks it a little bit better. Right now, Eric says the photo of Nick was fascinating. Yeah, the, uh, the we'll go back to that one. The, all those dots <laughs> that's just that's just something you don't get to see with your eyes uh, but it's interesting that this is happening just outside the visible light spectrum that it's at you know your eyes can see up to 700 nanometers and then this is happening at 720 or something um, or at least that's what my camera that's where my camera is looking for it let's see crash landon is here good to see you crash uh <laughs> Your eyes look like boar guys. Yeah, they do. Uh, and then Veritasium has a brilliant video about infrared. Uh, let's see. What other photos do I have in here? Yeah, see, these are a couple of these are ones like I hadn't edited yet, or I think I did edit them, but um, like lost the edit files. So like, you know, we start with this very red image, but just take it black and white, up the contrast. Um, so we could. 
you know, already this looks pretty interesting. Um, it just seems like on a you really want a bright, sunny day when you're shooting infrared because uh, you really want shadows, you really want contrast. Uh, and it just seems like, I mean, it makes sense that like the clouds are probably blocking some of the infrared. So you, you just are not getting a very well lit shot when you're shooting on a cloudy day or in shadows. But when you have a brightly lit, hard shadow day, uh, landscapes look really interesting because uh, it just seems like it seems like the contrast between light and dark is just more exaggerated in every little pocket and, and wrinkle uh, in a landscape. And then you get all the extra contrast in the sky. Um, and then, I don't even know, I can't tell. For all I know, that could be snow. I think I was flying over a snowy area. Or for all I know, that could be trees. Uh, I could be far enough away that those are just trees on mountaintops. Although I don't think so. No, because I actually see trees there and I think they're not getting completely lit up by the sun, so they don't actually look white. Actually, they may be evergreens, and I don't know, maybe evergreens react differently to the infrared. I mean, let's look. Well, yeah, I mean, here's a shot with, yeah, there's definitely trees, but like the, yeah, the, the snow is definitely reflecting the infrared better than the trees is. Trees are, uh, so it looks very white. What's this one? Oh, this is just an airplane. I guess nothing particularly special about this shot. It just uh, just looks interesting. I just made this one black and white. I mean, this is kind of a shot where you make it black and white and you really can't tell anything's different. Except for maybe that cone. That cone is interesting because that's another thing that happens here in infrared is that shirts, this is actually a dark shirt. I'm wearing a, a, a dark navy blue shirt. But I think most shirts like this, I'm guessing, I don't know how they make clothes, but it's not It's not like it's a, like a black material that they then print these flowers onto. I assume it's a white shirt, white cotton, and then they just print ink onto it. And the ink does not seem to uh, absorb infrared light the way that it absorbs visible light. So it might look dark. Uh, but I find that a lot when I'm shooting infrared that when I walk around, someone's wearing a dark black shirt, but it's not truly a black shirt. It's not made from black material. Um, and so the infrared just goes right through the dye, bounces right off the white shirt underneath, and just presents it as this light colored shirt. And I have occasionally had the issue where like some clothing is like more see-through in infrared. I mean, it's not like x-ray vision, but like you can definitely like see some layers uh, more sometimes depending on the shirt. Like I'm betting that shirt that Nick is wearing in this shot, it's probably a dark blue shirt and this is how it's presenting in infrared. And I think we're both wearing sunglasses and I get that sunglass effect. Here's a shot of my grandmother wearing sunglasses and the infrared is just going right through the the, Whatever part of those lenses that's blocking uh, that's blocking visible light, it's not blocking infrared. I, and I know it's the UV, which is on the other side of the visible light spectrum. UV is like, well, it's ultraviolet, so it's beyond violet. Uh, that's what I think is dangerous for your eyes. I'm not sure infrared light, I don't know if it is dangerous. Maybe we don't need sunglasses to block it out. We got several more comments. Uh, let's see. Eric says he looks like a particle hologram when Nick has all those particles on him. Uh, Adrian Ruscon says, happy birthday. It is my birthday. Thank you. Um, and then Eric wants to know, are there apps to view IR photos in normal light color? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's a weird question to answer because like you can't view them in, there is no normal. I don't know. Maybe I don't fully understand the question. But like, I mean, we're we're throwing a bunch of light onto this sensor that's only there to capture infrared. And then it's just writing what it thinks it should. It's writing a bunch of red and black on the sensor. And then I'm asking Lightroom to try to interpret that and, and shift it into a color scheme that makes some sense. I mean, like right now my skin almost looks like skin color more so than if I we were to switch to one of these other white balance modes. I mean, like this is not usable. This is not usable, not usable, not usable, not usable, not usable, uh, almost usable, 
and all, pretty, pretty, I mean, like, this is what I end up on. But this is just, like, a vis visible light interpretation of something that cannot be <laughs> expressed in visible light. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. And actually, I think that's a good segue into this, the space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope is shooting with near infrared. They call it the near cam, near infrared. Uh, it's a similar spectrum to this. I mean, mine is very narrow. It's just like 720 nanometers. I think the James Webb is also capturing that 720. It's doing like 600 up to like 5,000, I think. Let's see. It's, um, yeah, 600 up to 5,000 nanometers. Yeah. So it's capturing a lot more infrared than my camera is, but it is starting with this area and then moving up. So it's pretty much starting just outside or just at the end of visible light because I think 600 is still visible. Uh, but it's mostly missing the visible light spectrum. It's missing violet, the color violet. It can't pick that up in visible light. Um, but it's moving all the way up uh, to, to get to everything that's considered near infrared. And so that's a question that I've heard a lot is like, what does it mean to see a color image from James Webb? Like, let's pull up like this one um, that everyone's been talking about. This picture, which is that like, they just released this the other day of like, just looking, I think I think they said it's a, a grain of, of sand at an arm's length, like that tiny bit of the, of the night sky. Uh, and then these are a bunch of galaxies. This is a, I believe this is a 12 hour exposure. Uh, I read that it took 200 hours of exposure uh, not one solid exposure, but a, a, a bunch of like pieced together exposures. It took 200 hours for Hubble to expose a similar image, uh, but it takes the James Webb 12 hours to capture this image. So it's opening up its its aperture for, for 12 hours uh, to expose this image. But it's all capturing infrared light between 600 nanometers and 5,000 nanometers, or five microns is also one way to say that. Uh, but because this is all happening outside of visible, the visible light spectrum, these colors that you see are not, they're not the colors, um, or they're not, they're not these colors. Um, but in the same way that we adjust white balance on a camera or in Lightroom, there is a relationship between yellow and blue. We know that when we're, we're lighting a scene, uh, the, the lights we have, the bicolor lights we have move on a spectrum between yellow and blue. Uh, you know, that's pretty much our visible light spectrum is like from purple to red. It's, it's very similar to yellow and blue. Uh, so it makes sense to express these things on that same visible light spectrum that one of these that has, I guess the bluer lights are a shorter wavelength and the more orange lights are a quicker. Wait, no, I have this. Yeah, I said blue is shorter, red is longer. Um, and so it makes sense to express it this way in the only visual light language we can interpret, which is visible light, these colors. Uh, it makes sense to do it that way. But yeah, you have, you have to recognize that this is kind of like a false color monitor. These are not, this is not visible light that we're looking at. It's an interpretation of the, the infrared light. Uh, perhaps someone in the comments understands that better than me and, and can explain some of the nuance I may have missed. Yolo Snail is here on Twitch and says, what if you take a photo of a PIR sensor? I have to Google that. I don't even know what that is. PIR sensor? It's a, it's a motion sensor. I mean, I have a motion sensor. Let me grab one and see, see if it makes any difference here, if it, if it does anything. This is a little Philips Hue motion sensor, except I, for all I know, it's not using the same technology. Maybe it's not using passive infrared. Um, perhaps someone knows what kind of technology this is. Uh, and hopefully this thing's not dead. <laughs> I do have another one that I definitely know is working. Let's try that one too.
took me a second to find this one because it's, uh, yeah, same thing. I think I know this one's working. Uh, these are magnetic, and I forgot that. And I was like looking all around in this cabinet trying to figure out where I'd hidden it behind something, but it was like stuck to a metal bar up in the corner. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe these aren't passive infrared sensors. Um, but presumably, like this remote, if anyone missed that, um, you can see you can see it shooting out its infrared. I also notice this when I go on airplanes that the the screens, the entertainment screen in front of you, uh, a lot of times they have an infrared sensor to determine if you're close. Like I guess when like your hand comes up to it to push the button or the touch screen, it needs to turn on the screen. And so it's actually just blinking at you just like this the entire flight. It's funny to think that you're just being bombarded with light the whole time. It's just doing this like the entire flight waiting for your hand to like come close to it and I guess just bounce some of it back. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so there is like a whole world that opens up that you unlock when you have an infrared camera. So again, uh, I guess I do want to put a poll in. Let's see where everyone is. A lot of you are on Twitch, although I could probably just ask because there's not a crazy number of you. Um, I just I want to know if anyone has shot infrared i did i think i oh we yeah we have the um oh yeah we do have the poll on youtube um, and actually you know what i can't tell if my chat from youtube is coming in because now i'm seeing everyone uh that luke westwood is here sorry for missing the youtubers i don't know why it's not coming through on uh restream um, yeah south molten photos want to try a tv remote Algae's here. Um, but yeah, we have a, a poll going on YouTube right now. Uh, I was curious what experience people have with infrared. And it looks like 12% of you said, yes, your camera has night vision. Um, and 7% of you have used an IR filter. 10% of you have an IR modded camera. And most of you, 71%, have not used uh, infrared. So that's what I wanted to mention is there's a few ways to do this. Mine was the most maybe the most more expensive way to go uh, and the kind of permanent way to like have your camera modified. But it leads to some really interesting things. One, you get to use the camera you like and, and know how to use. I, I can actually shoot video and photos, which is interesting. Um, but the other way to do it is just to put a, a filter on top of your camera's lens because your sensor as it is, it's primarily picking up visible light, but it can pick up infrared. So if you block out all visible light with a filter that only lets in infrared light, you can shoot infrared. The problem is, I would imagine, compared to my camera setup, is that I think you're, because you're blocking so much light, I got, I got to imagine that the exposure is not great, that you're probably going to have to bump your ISO way up to, to 10,000. I don't, I don't know. And I think what the modification they do at Kalari Vision, which I'll pull up again, I think when they do that modification, they're taking something off the sensor and adding this new hot mirror um, that surely is, is better than putting a filter on your lens, but I don't know. So I, I'd love to hear if anyone in the, in, the, in the chat has experience with those with both methods and if there's one they prefer. And then I'd have to look at night vision. I mean, let me just look it up right now. Like what spectrum is night vision infrared? Because I'm assuming it's also a different range than what I'm shooting. Well, no, pretty much the same. 700 to 1,000. Yeah, so I'm shooting 720. Um, and Kalari Vision will give you some choices. Like if I start going through with this op with this process. Oh, yeah, this is for any Lumix camera. You can choose different ranges. So there's full spectrum, which is you want to see everything. There's two spectrum where you want to knock out UV and only see visible in IR. Um, there's these ones that are like just just on the cusp of infrared, like 590 nanometers. Actually, I don't know if it's showing. I realize I'm clicking. When I click these drop down boxes, they're actually showing up as like a different window that don't show up on the stream. Um, but I can see that the filters here, well, if I pick one, will it change? Oh yeah, it changes when I select it. 
Um, so you could choose 850 nanometers, uh, and they have an explanation of what all of these mean that like, I can't remember what it is. Like there's more contrast or something in 850. I can't remember the difference, but um, you have a few different options there. And then, yeah, you just send off your camera and you trust them to do the thing. <laughs> See if we're getting other uh, YouTube comments here. Um, Elon Vainstock is here. It says I look like an alien. <laughs> and let's see what uh, Twitch chat we're getting. Yeah, Yolo Snail says it looks like it's uh, that these these uh, these sensors look like they're PIR sensors. Um, and that Yellow Snail also might have used night vision camera when uh, they were really young. Yeah, a lot of camcorders used to come with it. And, I mean, the way they work is, I mean, I, I, I assume they're just taking advantage of the fact that their sensor is already picking up infrared and visible light. Like, I assume the camcorder manufacturers that were doing this weren't like, let's add a whole new infrared sensor or something. They weren't like adding expensive technology to these cameras. I think they were just going, oh, you know what? The sensor we're already installing, it captures visible or infrared. So what if when it's dark, we just throw an infrared lamp on the camera and it can pick that up? Um, actually, I'm trying to think my, the camcorder, the, the little Sony camcorder that I have, when you would flip on the, the night vision, it did feel like a big physical knob happening. I bet there was a whole filter going in front of the lens or inside the sensor blocking out visible light uh, and then it turns on its infrared lamp um, but as you can see with this camera like this doesn't just have to be night vision the sun is outputting so much infrared light that you can shoot infrared without night vision without using a night vision lamp um, but this, that's just one interesting thing you could do that's another reason i need to get like an infrared specific torch because it would be fun to like take this outside and not blind people in the eye with visible light, but actually shoot something with night vision. I mean, this would this would be a night vision camera, I imagine. Yellow Snail says, so is a full spectrum camera just a camera without any filter? Could you then add filters for visible IR, UV, etc.? Yeah, so full spectrum, I, I mean, I imagine this is just because sensors as they're currently built already capture UV light, visible light and infrared. Um, I imagine just because they're all so tightly packed together in terms of wavelength that if you're going to capture all of the visible light range, you're going to end up with a little bit of bleed on the ends. Um, I, I don't know the technology, but yes, they capture all three of those. And then that's why I guess that's why people put on UV filters to block out that. You could put on a filter to block out IR if you wanted. Um, or like Kalari Vision does, they, they could put specific filters on the sensor to, to hone in on a, on a specific area. And that's one thing that's interesting about the, the near cam on the James Webb te telescope is that, let me pull this up. It's capturing a really wide spectrum between, like I said, like between what I'm shooting, I'm shooting at 720 nanometers. It captures 600 nanometers all the way up to 5,000, which is still c considered near, uh, near infrared. Uh, this is not to be confused with like long wing, long, long wavelength infrared, I think is what it's called, uh, is where like thermal camera stuff is. When you see a camera like picking up the heat off of fire or a human body or something, that's thermal imaging that is also infrared, but it's like a much further down the spectrum infrared called long wavelength. So even even this huge spectrum that the near cam is capturing on the James Webb telescope, I don't think includes like the thermal stuff. Um, although I'm sure there's some thermal, you know, ramifications of the of the wavelengths they're capturing, but um, but it's not quite that that really long wavelength stuff. So here is all of the filters on the James Webb telescope or on the on the near cam. On that telescope there's actually 29 different filters and you can see the ones at the top that are covering a lot a lot of wavelength it's kind of like they have these filters that give you like a huge chunk of wavelength and then they have like so those are like the wide filters and then they have like the medium filters that give you just a little bit of spectrum and then the narrow filters that give you just a little bit so you can imagine just like to your question yellow snail about 
honing in on a specific part of the spectrum of light um, with, a, with a filter modification on a camera. The near cam has like a wheel of filters, 29 of them, and it can choose any one of them. And that helps them, I think that helps them figure out these colors in, in the end result picture um, and the data. So they can take a picture one time. I mean, I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is all part of the 12 hour exposure that it's really like, well, we're doing one hour with this filter and 30 minutes with this filter. I don't know, but they're somehow piecing it all together. But I think that's how you narrow in on like, what color exactly is that light that's coming in? Cause it's kind of like, it, it's hitting a bunch of things. But if we narrow in, we see, okay, yeah, now I can really see what's happening in that color band. I mean, I don't really understand the, the science behind it, but this is one of the techniques, one of the photographic techniques they use to understand this data and not just get like, <laughs> I guess it would just be a bunch of white light to them uh, if they didn't like put on all these filters and try to figure out what's happening in different different areas. And let's see if any, uh, let's look at some more of these pictures. Like how does NASA describe this picture? This is the, it's the galaxy cluster SMAC S0723 as it appeared 4.6 billion years ago. Um, now you may have heard that this light is so far away or the light that the James Webb telescope can capture. I mean, it can see light that's coming from like 13 and a half billion years ago. Um, because that's how, how deep into space it's looking, or I guess how, how far this light is, has traveled to, to reach the telescope. Uh, and so this particular stuff that it's seeing is uh, 4.6 billion years ago. I thought I read that like the stars here with the star burst are like closer stars. Um, and that's why they're, they're bursting like that. Um, that they're actually stars. Uh, whereas I think most of the stuff in this image is not stars, but a whole collection of stars. These are all galaxies that we're seeing. And then what was this photo? This is two stars locked in a tight orbit. Uh, oh, and these are actually two different cameras. They're saying that the near cam is the one on the left. And then the one on the right is a different camera. That's the mid infrared instrument. Um, oh, so I didn't even read about the other cameras. Like maybe the mid infrared instrument uh, is getting closer to those like long uh, wavelengths and, and capturing more of the thermal data, perhaps. I don't know. I'd have to read up a lot more on this, but I knew that the near cam, I knew that a lot of these photos that were coming out of James Webb were similar in a way to the, to the infrared camera that I'm shooting with. And then where's that other photo that I was looking at? Oh, this one, yeah. This is the Cosmic Cliffs. Webb's seemingly three-dimensional picture looks like craggy mountains on a moonlit evening. In reality, it is the edge of the giant gaseous cavity within NGC 3324. Uh, and the tallest peaks in this image are about seven light years high. So this is a nebula with intense UV radiation. So what exactly, which camera took this? This was near cam. It says this is another one that was that was imaged by the near cam and the mid infrared instrument, uh, but it seems like the near cam has more crisp resolution uh, than the other instrument. So yeah, another image where like, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Like the blues and oranges are not the way it looks visibly, but this has always been. I mean, a lot of space photography, like there's a great photo of Mercury, or no, Venus. Uh, Venus is covered in clouds, and so it's hard to see the surface. And so I think they used infrared imaging to, you know, on, on space probes even many years ago to look through the clouds and actually map the surface. So there's an interesting, I mean, I should just Google it. There's an interesting photo of Venus 
which like looks all colorful, like blue and I mean, yeah, it's this one, green and red. I mean, this is an actual, oh, here we go, this is cool. Like, well, yeah, I think they're showing us like, here's the clouds, you can't see the surface of Venus, and here's underneath. It's like, Venus doesn't look like this. It's not green and blue and, and, and red and orange, but that's one way to present the data here, that these are, we're, get, we're getting different wavelengths back. When we, when we bounce infrared off the surface, some of the wavelengths uh, are, are coming back, they, they look different. Um, so that's one way to present it. But yeah, I've been looking through a lot of space books with my my three-year-old kid and uh, haven't yet explained to him like false color. And <laughs> I mean, it's hard to explain. Yo, Snail says, I, I feel like I probably would have understood all of this when I was in school, but it's just beyond me now. <laughs> One thing I want to know, oh, David's here. Good to see you, David, on Facebook. Um, David Beji, who I worked with at State Farm years ago, and then uh, more recently I've done a lot of projects with him, freelance projects. Uh, and David, because you're here, I, I haven't talked to you in person about this, but and for everyone else listening, I did leave my job at the recount. I'm fully freelancing now, so I'll, I'll, I'll get on your calendar. We'll talk. Um, but also putting that out to anyone else watching, you should know that I've, I've made a, a, a life change here uh, to do that. I mean, in, in some way, that's why I'm here live streaming to you because I suddenly have time again. I've been traveling. I've been in New York like it was it was 12 of 13 weeks. It's kind of why I went from like no, like I was I was streaming a bunch like went back in March and then just nothing until now. It's just because I've been traveling back and forth to New York every week for work. Uh, it's been it's been busy, but uh, I'm finally loosened up my schedule and, and back to a more flexible schedule where I can take on projects for for clients. Um, so if you have projects that need a documentary filmmaker, let me know. Uh, one thing I want to know, I was gonna like make a like a YouTube uh, poll kind of like this, but uh, I'll, I'll probably just ask you here because um, it's, it's probably a little bit easier is I want to know what you want to see next time in terms of like weird, I have this idea that I want to do a bunch of like weird streams like this, where it's like, what what weird camera can I pull out and see uh, what kind of effect we can do? I talked about thermal imaging and there is a company uh, called Doogie that wants to send me their S98 Pro uh, phone. It's a phone, but it has a, a thermal imaging camera on it. And so it would be interesting to do an entire live stream in thermal imaging, so that's one option for you. Uh, two would be drone. I'm, I have not done this before, but I'm sure that my DJI Mavic 2 Zoom uh, can do some sort of streaming. So it might be interesting to like go in the backyard and <laughs> try to stream, like microphone down here, uh, but uh, but uh, drone up in the sky doing the doing the video. Uh, so that's that's option number two for next time. Uh, third option would be streaming through my 22 year old 480p camcorder. And, uh, the fourth option would not even be streaming through a weird camera, but I ran a race in New York, a midnight race. Uh, part of it went, went through a, a photo studio, uh, and there were all these professional photographers there. So at some point I should take you through the photos they captured 2,900 photos. And we could talk about this crazy race, uh, this crazy street race in New York. Uh, and the fifth option would be, uh, Gameplay. I mean, a lot of you are, are here on Twitch. Should I get back to playing Horizon Forbidden West <laughs> on Twitch? So I, I want you to throw your vote in the chat. Uh, do you want to see thermal imaging camera? I'm betting that's what people are going to say. Uh, drone or old camcorder, standard definition camcorder. Or, I mean, I could just start doing all running stuff on this channel. I, I'm really into running this summer. Uh, I'm faster than I've ever been. It's my birthday today. I'm 38 years old, but I'm... I'm getting faster all the time. Uh, so I'd love to talk about that. Uh, or for just gameplay, just getting back into Horizon Forbidden West. So let's see, uh, Luke on YouTube says, would love to see thermal imaging and how it works. Uh, Veggie T, who's also here, is says, uh, 
is there a camera that will record different wavelengths of IR as different channels of RGB? Yeah, that'd be interesting. I imagine, I don't know, you'd almost think to do it, it would have to have like different sensors or it would almost have to do like, almost like bracketing where it would have to like throw a filter down, take the picture, throw a different filter down, take the picture. I, I would think you'd have to segment it somehow to like actually store the data separately. Um, Luke Westwood says happy birthday on YouTube. On Twitch, Crash Landon says the a 360 degree stream would be rad. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. I used to have one of those little, uh, what, what was that company? Theta. I had a little Theta 360 camera that I played around with a few times. Uh, and I always thought the photos were more interesting than the video because the video was low resolution, although they've gotten higher resolution now. Uh, I should do a 360. Let me add that to my notes here. 360 camera uh, is the vote from Crash Landon. And then LG80 says, the frame burned into my eyes. I'm so, I, so I'm seeing a green rectangle now. <laughs> Wait, which, <laughs> which thing is burned into your eyes? And LG liked the order that I had, had presented. Thermal imaging first, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll get to all of these eventually, but I wanted to know what, what you all want to see next time. Like maybe I'll do a, another stream in a week. Oh, and Yellow Snail says Pro Blends. That would be an interesting one to stream. I'll write that down too. Pro Blends. I need to get one of those. Uh, what was that company? Laowa, I think, makes that Pro Blends. I'll pull that up for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about. Um, Laowa Pro Blends. I'm definitely spelling it wrong. Let's look at it on. Surely it's on BH, right? So here's the Laowa 24 millimeter F14 probe. Uh, and it does indeed look this crazy. It's like, there's the micro four thirds mount, or I don't even know what mount this is. Um, I think they make one for micro four thirds. There's the mount. And then it is this long, <laughs> it's this long stick. And it, I think it has lights on the end because presumably when it's F14, you, are getting you know just terrible exposure. So I think those are like little LEDs on the end, just because you kind of need them, right? It even has a USB cable to power the lights. It looks like. Um, but yeah, these these uh, probe lenses are kind of fun. You, you can do it's like a macro lens, uh, so it's like you stick it in a book or something, and you know you can get like super close up to the to the letters. It would be a weird. I mean, yeah, they call it a bug eye perspective. It would definitely be a strange live stream choice, but that's what we're talking about here. So yeah. As long as we're, we're talking about equipment, uh, I can also talk about the equipment that I am now using here in front of me. Um, on the last stream that I did, I unboxed my new Mac Studio, my new Mac Studio display, uh, and then a few other things. I actually made some changes in the last few days. Um, one was, I bought the nano texture screen because it, well, one, because it was the, the only one available um, a week ago, but it costs $300 more. It's an $1,800 monitor. And then I, I ended up trading it out because uh, one, this other monitor came in, came back into stock. It's the regular non nano technology. Uh, it's only, it's $300 less. It's only $1,500. And I actually did not like the nano texture at all. I don't know if any of you have it or were thinking about buying it, but my takeaway was, yes, it does eliminate glare, which is the whole point. Like if you have a light back here bouncing off the screen, uh, it makes a lens flare on this glossy screen. On the nano texture screen, it just kind of makes like a muted circle. Uh, so it definitely is less, less pronounced. Um, but the flip side is I can see the texture even without my new glasses. I can I can see that there's like, especially when you're looking at a white screen, you just see like film grain. You can just see the, the texture. And it also made it a little bit less sharp. I'd say it was probably 80% as sharp as this screen. This screen definitely looks sharper to me. And I didn't like seeing the, the film grain texture across the whole screen. Uh, so for me, my takeaway was like, Unless you're 
in a TV studio doing some sort of like live editing or something, or there's a reason you need to be like with lights all around you. I mean, I even have like a light here, the window here, light back there, but none of them are reflecting right off the screen into my eyes. So I don't see any lights. I see a light right now. When I come way over here, I can see the light behind me. Um, and yeah, on the other version of this monitor, it wouldn't be so pronounced, but it just wasn't necessary. And like, why spend more money? Um, so I ended up returning the nano texture and got this cheaper one. I also last week talked talked about I had purchased like a cheaper keyboard called like the Satechi Slim, uh, which is like a copy of the Apple Magic Keyboard. It was ninety dollars, and I didn't really want to spend the like nearly two hundred dollars that this Magic Keyboard is. Um, but ultimately, after using it, I was like, it's not as nice as a Magic Keyboard, so I got this. Uh, I also don't love, I told Nick this, that I don't love that this Magic Keyboard, I'm, I'm used to the one from the iMac Pro that was like all black or like space gray. This one's like less dark gray. It looks a little bit shinier. Uh, and they even like gave it more curve on the edge. I just don't like it nearly as much. I hate that I had to spend like $180 for this keyboard, but that's what it costs. And then the other thing that I did was I really wanted to get this microphone, this Shure uh, SM7B. We've been using them at work at the recount, and I, I mean, all podcasters use these mics now. All Twitch streamers use them. Uh, it's an expensive mic, though. You could see I'm actually I get a creator discount at B&H, so it's a four hundred dollar mic, and I can get it for three eighty. Um, CNET here seems to think that you can get it for sixty three dollars less, probably on eBay. That's what I ended up doing. This is a brand new mic that I decided to buy and it's, uh, sorry, it's it's a used mic, but it's practically brand new. It I think it was like an open box situation and I managed to get it for $81 less than b and I got it for just about $300 on eBay. That's with tax and shipping included. That was the big thing. It's like on, on b and I don't have to pay uh, I don't have to pay tax. The shipping's free, and I don't have to pay tax because I use a PayBoo card, which is B&H's card that gets you a sales tax uh, rebate instantly. So I actually had to get a pretty good deal on eBay for this to even be worth it because it was like, if I buy it from B&H, I get the money back guarantee. I can send it back to them if I decide I don't want it. I get you know quick shipping and the backing of a company I like and use a lot. Um, so I, I kind of calculated for myself. I think I was like, I have to get it for at least 20% off. And, or maybe it was even more than that. I can't remember what I calculated. And it was like, but with also with the sales tax I have to pay on eBay and the shipping, uh, it has to be like, I have to pay like 280 before sales tax and shipping or it's not worth it. And so that's what I bid and, and was able to get it. And then the other thing I got, which I don't know if we can really see here, is, um, oh yeah, you can see it right here. This little blue box. People always recommend this with, the with this mic the uh, sm7b it's just kind of a low signal mic i find i have to turn it up at least like 60 70 percent on my on this little wave xlr device i'm using uh just to get a decent signal out of it and i've always found like if i plug it into a camera it always seems like you have to turn it up like almost all the way and so a lot of people recommend this cloud lifter which brings up the gain I actually have no idea how it works because it's not even powered. It's just a box, and somehow it, it brings up the gain significantly. I think I had this thing, my knob turned up to about 60%, and now it's turned to like 35 40%, so it gives you some extra space and apparently does it without adding much noise. I mean, you all can be the judge, though I am hearing, I don't know if you're hearing it right now. Let me turn off the... You can hear this little box down here. Um, my little switcher box it does have a little fan on, which I don't think I should turn off for the whole stream. But let me turn it off right now and see if it, see if you can hear the difference. So right now it's on. You're still listening to it. And now it's off. I don't know if you were picking that up on the mic. I'm not monitoring myself. Um, but uh, now I'll turn it back on. But yeah, I am curious, like, what kind of noise level I'm getting. I guess you can tell me, like, what do you think about the <laughs> the SM7B? I actually, the cloud lifter just showed up, like, 
five minutes before I started this stream. So I plugged it in real fast, uh, had to reset the levels. I did another like sync test to hopefully make sure that uh, the cloud lifter wasn't introducing more like delay and it doesn't seem like it was. I'm actually curious about my delay too. I had to do one thing today was for some reason, the, the video from the GH4 that's shooting infrared and maybe, maybe this makes sense because it's just an older camera with like a, like it's doing less work with the processor. I don't know. The GH4 was somehow sending its signal out over HDMI faster than the GH5 Mark II that is sitting up here shooting the behind the scenes shot. So these two shots were out of sync. So I actually delayed the this infrared shot. I think I delayed it like 170 milliseconds so that it would be in sync with the other camera. Uh, they might not be perfect, but they're pretty good right now. And then I delayed the audio 100 milliseconds uh, to, to try to get it right on there. So you'll have to tell me how I'm doing audio-wise. Let's see what people are saying. So uh, Yolo Snail says, oh, Algae, I see what Algie's talking about. Algie said earlier, the frame burned into his eyes. He's talking about the uh, <laughs> the blue and pink around my... Uh, around my shot. Yeah, I imagine that pink is probably strong enough that when you walk away, yeah, you get a, what, a green, <laughs> a green rectangle, yeah. Oh, and maybe he's even talking about like this one. Yeah, there's a lot of pink in this shot. Uh, Yolo Snail says only 1500 for the same display as a 10 year old I iMac. Yeah, there's a lot of complaining to be had about the price of this new studio display when like, you know, does it do Anything particularly interesting? Oh, here's, you can actually see, uh, see the display here. Um, I mean, I looked at a lot of different displays and it's like, there's just not a lot of competition. Unfortunately, it's like I have to spend $1,500 because there are a lot of good displays, but they're 4K and they're not 5K like this. Um, I mean, I could get a bigger display with less resolution, but ultimately Nick was of the impression of the, of the, opinion that I would not be happy with a different display. I might have been. I don't know. I could have gotten a bigger one. Though now that I'm doing like mic on this boom arm over to here and camera right here, I don't know if I could go much bigger on the on the monitor. And I am pretty happy with the way this monitor looks and I am sitting relatively close to it too. Uh, and then Yellow Snail says, why didn't you just keep your old keyboard or just buy the old one? So here was the thing, because I left my job at the recount, I had to send back the iMac Pro that they had given me uh, to work with. And so that's why I had, to, I had to get everything. I had to send back the keyboard and the iMac Pro. And so I needed a Mac Studio now with a screen and I needed a new keyboard. Uh, I used my own uh, Logitech mouse so that was fine but yeah i had to buy a bunch of new stuff so that's why i've been purchasing purchasing this stuff and i also traditionally would use this boom that's holding up this camera right here i've sometimes used it for a mic or sometimes i put the mic on the desk but i realized like in last week's stream i was kind of like i was kind of doing this sort of thing where i was talking to like two cameras and it would have been nice to be able to move the mic around like this uh, and i didn't have the capability with a you know, the, the tabletop stand I had couldn't come out here. Um, and so I decided to get this blue, that's another new purchase in the last week, this, this little blue, uh, the company that makes blue microphones um, makes this arm. I think it was about $100 to buy this arm. And yeah, the, uh, the cloud lifter is normally $142. That's with my creator discount on B&H. And again, I wouldn't pay shipping or sales tax so that's nice um, but i was able to get it for just about a hundred i think uh on ebay and so that was just just barely worth it to to buy a used one uh, but again it looks it looks pristine it looks like it was probably never used i think there's a lot of people that like try to get into podcasting or live streaming and they buy i mean these are the things that people buy it seems like this uh, these two things are paired together pretty often the cloud lifter and the uh the sure SM7B are very popular options. And so, yeah, there's a lot of people buying them new and then selling them used on eBay, which is good for me. Uh, 
And yeah, and I, and I think I do have a keyboard. I, I have another keyboard for like my oldest iMac, um, but it's not the one with the number pad. And I just really like the number pad and the arrows. And for Final Cut, I like having these extra like buttons up here. So um, I, I just had to splurge and get the real, the real thing. But yeah, I couldn't believe how expensive a keyboard is. And then Yellow Snail says, is it possible to make an SM7B sound bad? I don't know. Uh, and let's see what people are saying on YouTube. Um, Shaggy Mummy says, how reversible is the IR mod on your GH4? That's a good question. I'm assuming not very. <laughs> um, let's see. I might have a way to show you the sensor. Let's take a look at it. Uh, let's flip over to this split screen. The split screen will be interesting because... I'm going to pull the lens off, and I'm assuming this signal is just going to go out, or maybe it'll just go white. Let's see. There it goes. Yeah, oh, it's just solid white. Okay. Uh, so I'll turn this thing around for you to see it. There it is. Um, the sensor just looks blue, which if you're used to shooting with a Lumix camera, you know that the sensor does not look blue. It looks uh, like purple-y. Uh, when you reflect light off of it. And you can't really see it in the shot very well, I don't think. Um, but when I look inside there, to me, yeah, I can almost see what looks like hot glue <laughs> around the edges. I mean, there's some sort of glue that they've put on this, this hot mirror uh, to add it to the sensor. So I'm guessing this is not particularly reversible, um, that that thing is glued on there. Uh, so I don't know. I guess I could look at the Kalari website and see if they do, like, reversals. There's probably some note about that. Um, I'll just Google it. Like, how reversible is the IR conversion? How reversible is IR conversion? It just says... This one website, this is from Adorama. It just says, camera conversion is not reversible, which makes sense. That's what I would guess, yeah. Let me pop this lens back on. That's, an, that's a nice shot. Flip this around. So, yeah, I mean, that's one reason I put an IR tag on top. It's like, I mean, not that this isn't <laughs> removable, but it's like this camera is always infrared. There's no there's no other, other choice here. Well, there's a slightly wider shot. Oh, and this is interesting because this is like, I talked about how this shirt is a dark colored shirt, but it reflects back as white. Um, but all of these dark things are actually showing up as as dark uh, on on the infrared. Although I do find this a lot, you kind of see it here, yeah. It's like to the eye, this part of, this plastic part of the arm is the same color as this like, I guess this part's metal. Um, but I see this a lot in infrared that it actually shows up as like mo many different colors here. Like this looks like one color, this looks like a different color, this knob looks like a different color. Because, uh, yeah, like, this is plastic, this is plastic, this is metal. Uh, so they're all reflecting infrared back in different ways. I have to work on the uh, the tension on this on this thing so it sits perfectly. Oh, Luke says, uh, it sounds great. Uh, I'm glad everyone likes the sound of this SM7B. I mean, one thing I noticed, one of the reasons I wanted to jump to it was my blue baby bottle, which I'll grab real quick. This is the mic I was using last week. And I, I like this. This is also a $400 microphone. I got this years ago for half price, like on Black Friday. So I got a good deal on it. Um, it is a good microphone, but compared to the Shure SM7B, this one is just like, it just picks up everything. It's like very omnidirectional. It picks up like the person mowing their lawn two houses away. It picks up everything that's happening in another room. Uh, Nick and I both use this for the podcast. I think on the latest episode that I still have not edited, I apologize that I've been sitting on it a while. I think I can hear 
his wife, Kristen, like <laughs> several rooms away. Um, and this one is just much more focused. And so I think that's why people love it so much. But I noticed last week in the, the stream I did, even just when I turned off of the mic, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this doesn't sound great for me to talk away from the mic, but I'm kind of curious to see if it sounds less echoey. Um, it just sounded like I was very distant a lot if I just like barely stepped off of this mic. And so I'm kind of curious what this one, how this one performs. I mean, here's a decent test. I'm away from the microphone and now I'm coming back. Um, but I, I'm, I'm guessing primarily what I'll like about this mic is that it, it's rejecting more of the distant sound that's happening. Yellow Snail says, do they both use the full frame for video? Um, yeah, so I believe the GH4 does use its full sensor for video. Um, I mean, let's see. Let's see if we can, if I can pop it into a photo mode and what happens here if it gets any tighter. I can't remember how the GH4 deals with 4K, although we might not be in 4K mode right now. Huh, nothing changed. Even though I just switched into a photo mode, it looks identical. That's interesting. I'm kind of surprised by that. Let's go into split mode here so we can actually see what's happening on the screen. Uh, I'm in video mode right now. And I'm in, it, it actually doesn't look like it's changing anything. Maybe I have it set so that it's always in 16 by nine. That's weird. I'm going to all sorts of weird modes on here. I don't even know what it's doing now. Oh, now I've now I've broken it. There we go. I don't know. Sorry, didn't answer that question very well. And then Yellow Snails also says, I really like my Logitech K780 keyboard. As a laptop user, I much prefer a chiclet keyboard. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right that like using an Apple keyboard for a long time because they're that like what is it, the butterfly or I don't know, but it's that kind of keyboard that like barely goes in. It does feel like it can kind of hurt your fingers over time. Although I think I've been using Apple computers for so long that I now am completely used to that feel and that's the feel I wanted. So when I got the Satechi, which is like a knockoff, I could just feel it, it felt different and I needed to go back to the normal uh, Apple click. Let's see what everyone's saying on YouTube. Uh, let's see. Z Rotor earlier said smartphones often have near infrared capabilities. They can image the IR transmitter of a remote control that you cannot see. Yeah, I have noticed that. That yeah, sometimes on a phone you can take pictures of of uh, like a remote flashing and pick that up. Yeah, Shaggy Mummy says, that, so the mod on the IR camera is rem is adding something, not removing something. I think, I can't remember. I feel like there's some built-in filter on the sensor that they remove. I don't know if it describes that on there. Um, let's see if it says, like, what this... What this actual... This conversion service replaces the camera's internal hot mirror filter with our high quality custom manufactured glass replacement infrared filter. So I think they are taking something off. There may be a, a hot filter already on the sensor that is intended to block out some of the UV and infrared light and really focus on visible. And I think they take that off and then add their own. But it definitely looks different and which makes sense because it's blocking a different spectrum of light. and. Th their glue s system does not look as elegant as whatever like Lumix does uh, when they put theirs on. So I think it might be a two-part process, but I don't know. And then Luke Westwood says, I remember in your video about converting the camera to IR years ago, you said it wasn't reversible as a warning. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we did a podcast episode about this a few years ago. It was back when Nick and I were in um, Utah funny i clicked over to picture my grandmother right when i said nick um we went to utah to shoot some stuff which i might have some of those photos here let's see 
maybe not. Maybe I decided they were. I didn't get very many good photos from that trip. Oh, I think this is one. This is one from that trip, yeah. And then this is also from that trip. And then this, I thought was an inter interesting photo because it again shows that like fabric thing that happens with infrared. Like here's a red, white, and blue American flag. And it, uh, I don't know what I've just done. And yeah, it, the, the, the colors are barely discernible. It's mostly just, mostly just sending infrared light back. And here's a picture of Amy. Uh, in infrared, which again shows that kind of like skin smoothing effect that happens. Uh, actually, this is a pretty good shot because like she has probably like the dark eyes that happen in infrared, but because she's squinting and because it's such a bright day, it actually doesn't look like pools of black eyes. Uh, it's probably because a lot of sunlight is hitting her in the eye in the shot. Um, so I thought that, that was a cool one just because it shows that kind of the first layer of skin becomes invisible. And here's another one with just very dark skies compared to very bright white leaves. And then I took a bunch of shots when I went to, I went to Canada, Nova Scotia years ago for a film festival and took these shots. And this is one of those things where I don't even think I've done like a selective color thing. Maybe I did. But I'm pretty sure this is just like the way this was rendering in the shot. Maybe I'm wrong about that. It's hard to tell because I don't think this is actually the raw file. This is just one that I imported. No, see, even in this shot, I can see that there's a person in the background with like a bluish shirt. <laughs> it may just be the way I've color balanced it. It's like most things are appearing black and white. Um, but I don't think I did a selective color thing on this. I think it's just a weird artifact of the of the infrared. Oh, and that's a good example of like, oh yeah, kind of three different versions of the same thing. Like how it looks out of the camera, how it looks once I've white balanced it to get some, some discernible difference in colors. And I end up with like this kind of golden sepia sky and these very white vines that almost look like snow versus we can change this kind of shot to black and white. This is actually a different shot, but same location. This, I like this infrared shot a lot because it really, I mean, I'm sure I've exaggerated the contrast in the edit, but I love the way the shadow is happening on top of the vines and that very dark sky with those very white clouds. And then here's Andy. This was years ago. I actually put a bellows system on front of the IR camera. So bellows is like, it, it's like that Laua probe lens. It, it creates, it turns your like 50 millimeter lens that I have here into a macro lens, uh, depending on how far away you put it from the camera. And actually this is a trick you can do. I mean, I think you could do it without a bellows. I think you can move your lens away from your camera. And I, if you can focus correctly, which I, unfortunately, I guess you may lose uh, focus uh, settings on a lot of lenses when you take them off the camera. But this manual lens, I think I was still able to focus it. Uh, so it makes for a good macro camera. And that's how I took like these super close-ups of Andy in infrared. I'm not sure the infrared is doing much for him except for it's turning his orange fur blue. I have a bunch of those here. <laughs> and then here's a couple shots I took in New York, which again, it's like it only is interesting because of the clouds and the sky. But it's interesting, yeah, that this is not even fully black and white. Um, I could make it black and white. And then it looks more normal, but um, I messed it up again. I keep jumping forward back. So... But yeah, you can see a little bit of blue on there. And then this one, too, has that crazy, weird uh, trees happening. But here it is if you just go to black and white. This was one thing that made me really appreciate the infrared camera in New York was walking around. I mean, where's one of my favorite shots? Um, well, maybe I don't have it in here. I mean, 
you're just walking around the city and I didn't feel like there was a lot of trees in New York around where I lived. This was right near my apartment. Um, but suddenly when you're walking around with the live viewfinder on this camera and every tree is just popping with white, I would suddenly see trees that I hadn't noticed before. And it's like, oh, there actually is a decent amount of green stuff sparsely populated in the neighborhood. Uh, and so the camera actually like helped me appreciate that. Like, oh, look, there they are. Uh, there's all those, all those trees. Yellow Snail says, the color shifts slightly when you change from photo to video, but that was it. Uh, <laughs> and Algie saw the cat, Andy the cat. Uh, he's actually down here right now. Um, I don't have a great way to show him. I will just wait for him to wake up and come over here. And then let's see if anyone, what people are saying on YouTube. Uh, nothing new. So let's see, I should probably get going in the next 10 minutes or so, but um, let me see what else I had on my agenda here. We already figured out what you want to see next time. You want to see a thermal radiation camera, if I can get that, um, or the drone flight. Or we'll just do both of those in the next two, two streams. I thought it was interesting that the, the camera that does the thermal imaging. It's interesting whenever I click to this, how it like, it's like refreshing something. I don't know why when I click over to this, oh, I don't know. It's doing it sometimes. <laughs> uh, there's like a little jerkiness when I, when I click over to this camera, uh, the thermal camera that I'm interested in trying out, it's this, well, let me, let me, I should just show you cause I, I think it's interesting. Uh, their graphic. The Doogie S98 Pro. I think they're going to send me one of these. Presumably this is an Android phone, yeah. And it's supposed to be kind of like a rugged phone that looks like an alien. Uh, but it's, it's got the thermal camera built in. When I saw this, though, I mean, this should jump out. It's like a red flag to everyone. I was like, what? The camera is 256 by 192 pixels? That sounds horrible. Um, and it, it is from a resolution standpoint. But then I realized, well, one, I was like, is this just fake uh, here? Because this looks higher res than that. Um, but then I realized, I mean, I will have to try out the technology. What it sounds like they've done is they recognize that the IR camera is not very high res. It's not going to give you a lot of great detail. But there's a visible camera right next to it that is capturing a good amount of detail. And so what if we just mix them together and you know give the texture to the thermal camera? Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I'll have to get creative, I imagine, to figure out how to rig that up. I don't know if a camera like that is just ready to stream. I'll probably have to do some sort of screen capture or something. But like if we throw the the thermal camera right here, and maybe if I can like output it, you know, if there's a way for me to just capture the screen live, that would be one way to do it. So I'll have to figure that out. Uh, but we'll wait until I get the camera. And I think that's... That's everything I wanted to talk about today. Uh, so if you are interested in getting into IR photography, I suppose you could, I mean, Kalari Vision is the company I used years ago. I would recommend them if that's something you want to do. Uh, you know, if you have an old camera and $300 to spare and want to get into, uh, to me, it's been more of a photography hobby than video. Uh, though I I have been thinking over the years, I'm trying to get these hairs off. It'd be cool to find a documentary subject that would benefit from from shooting an IR. I mean, part of me thinks like it'd be interesting to go to political events and shoot like a rally in IR, but I don't know what that would, you know, IR works well in the sun. It doesn't work so well under, under artificial lights. Um, you know, it's best with like wildlife. I think if there was like a film where you were trying to like show plants more or something. I mean, I, I think I've heard that like some aerial photography uses IR specifically to, you know, see through clouds or like maybe to exaggerate the plants if that's what you're looking for against a dark backdrop. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a, an actual documentary video subject matter that would, would benefit from shooting in IR. Uh, but for photography, it can make some interesting things, especially if you're into like high contrast black and white photos. 
Uh, it's a lot of fun to play with. But I suppose the cheaper way to try it out, uh, you may not get the same great results, but like, you know, you could always borrow or rent an IR filter and pop it on your camera and see what kinds of things you get. Um, and maybe next time I stream, I'll have figured out, I should probably buy some sort of IR light because that'd be cool to do some night vision. So I want to thank everyone for joining me. Let's see what last things people have said. Um, Algie said, I didn't know there were still rooftop water towers in New York. Oh, yeah. That's what's fun about this photo. Uh, they're all over the place. There's like hundreds, thousands of them in New York. Uh, I guess they're still in use. I don't know. But it, it does feel very New York to me. I mean, you can see two just in this picture. Um, I don't know how to go back to the... black and white version. There we go. Oh, also, I, I forgot about this one. This was one of the first test photos I ever took with the IR camera because I heard that there were these little like infrared bands on a $5 bill. I guess that's one way to tell that it's the real thing. Also, the color here, that five in the bottom right corner, like I think that's like a purple, dark purple five, but uh, in infrared, it shows up as blank, which is interesting. And then Yolo Snail is wondering if there's a drone with a thermal camera. There must be. I mean, that that would have, uh, you know, that, that'd be useful for some people for military applications, perhaps. Uh, and Yolo Snail says, Dookie has been doing thermal cameras and phones for a while now. They get pretty decent reviews. Yeah. So it'd be fun to play with that. And then Algie says, I thought the thermal cameras got higher res since Predator. Yeah. <laughs> In pretty much every thermal camera, it just overlays the thermal over visible light camera. That makes sense. Yeah, now I understand. Yeah, but when I first saw that resolution number, I was like, what do you mean 250 pixels wide? That sounds horrible. Uh, even the expensive uh, FLIR cameras are pretty low res. Algae says, thanks for the stream. Well, yeah, uh, let's see if anyone said anything on YouTube before I go. But I appreciate you uh, coming back to my, my return to streaming. Um, Let's see, on YouTube, uh, Ralph Fratura says, Las Vegas, Philip Bloom did it. Um, now I already forgot what we were talking about. Uh, Luke Westwood says, oh, yeah, we already read that one. Wait, so wait, what did Philip Bloom do in Las Vegas? A thermal imaging drone? <laughs> oh, not a doc, but a feature. I see. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, sh I should look that up. Um, I do feel like there was some... I think it was actually shot on film, uh, but I do think there was a documentary that shot in infrared or something like infrared. Maybe it was UV, uh, but it was something where like everything was showing up pink on camera. And I think it was a film about war. And I think like to them, I, I seem to remember reading that like the point of it was to kind of like, I don't know, like pull you out of how normalized war is. And like, let's look at it through like literally a crazy lens. Um, and try to experience it that way. I can't remember if that was exactly their motivation, but like there was some thinking like that about like there's a reason to shoot this a certain way. Well, thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, this was a dream of mine to just do this weird all infrared <laughs> stream. I'm sure you're happy that I did some other other shots, some behind the scenes shots and some split screens and things. So we weren't just sitting on this the entire time. I thought about just doing this 100% of the time. Uh, that was that was the original idea. But uh, thank you for joining me. And I will try to do another stream like this next week, probably. And I have a podcast that I need to finish editing. So I'll get that out to you soon. So thank you. And uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah.